Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. As I understand it, it's a very general audience, and my intention is to begin in a very general way um, and to talk about um, auditory processing from the point of view of the most important phenotype, and that is perception. So everything that Dr. Petit talked about and everything you're going to hear in this course at a more detailed level is for the purpose of supporting auditory perception, and at least for human beings, supporting speech and language acquisition and, and ultimately complex auditory communication. So I'm going to begin um, by talking about the development of auditory perception, and I'm going to mix in a few findings that we have from the level of central auditory processing, that is mechanisms that we believe support um, behavior. As I go through it, feel free to interrupt me um, and ask questions. I'm happy to stop at any time. So let me begin with just a few basic principles, and these are the principles that I hope to demonstrate today as I speak to you. So the first one is, and I'll demonstrate this, auditory perception matures very slowly. That is, we only gradually attain adult perceptual skills across maybe a decade or more, at least for human development. And I'll talk about um, the human developmental studies because that really formulates most of what we know about the development of auditory perception. The other aspect of it is all auditory percepts, the ability to localize sounds or distinguish between frequencies, all of these skills, they don't mature synchronously. They mature asynchronously, as if very different neural proce processes support each of the different perceptual skills that, that emerge. Um, and unfortunately, at least for today's lecture, there are very few strong correlations between a very specific neural mechanism uh, that, that supports perceptual maturation and any specific percept that we might talk about. We know about a vast number of um, developmental changes in the nervous system, uh, from molecular changes at the level of receptor molecules to changes in, in connections, but most of these things happen very early in development and they precede the development of perception. So it turns out to be a great mystery uh, what the neural mechanisms are that ultimately support the emergence of really uh, very elegant auditory perceptual skills. And finally, I'll, I'll tell you that most synaptic properties, that is the real functional um, bases of all computations in the nervous system, they mature mostly before auditory perceptual skills are attained. Now, this data obviously comes from non-human uh, organisms, but um, if we roughly relate the age of non-human organisms to human organisms, um, it's likely to be the case that almost all synaptic properties, ion channels, um, uh, membrane properties actually reach adult levels of performance before the organism reaches its adult level of perceptual performance. But I'll, I'll talk about one interesting difference here, and it relates to something that uh, Professor Patir mentioned, which is the development of inhibition and GABA-A receptors. So perception matures slowly. Um, human beings first begin to hear uh, uh, as feti in, in utero, and we know this by presenting sounds directly and monitoring an eye blink reflex. And if those studies are performed, then we find as a function of gestational age, eye blink reflexes to sound reach about 100% um, somewhere between 25 and 30 weeks of gestation. So we human beings begin to hear in utero, but it's then over the course of the next decade that we really attain adult perceptual skills. So I'm going to go through a number of these examples now. I'll go, I'll go through four examples. The first one relates to, um, relates to um, gap detection, uh, silent periods in our speech, which are called, and these silent gaps are called voice onset times, and they allow us to distinguish between different phonemes that we use to communicate with one another. So let me, let me play this for you. We'll see whether this works or not. 
Now, you can't hear the silent gaps, but they're critical for you to distinguish between these two sounds. Um, and in laboratory, independent of language, we can assess what the shortest gap is that one can hear. And then we can look at how that develops over time. So I'm going to present, I'm going to present to you, uh, let's start with a, a 50 millisecond gap. Try again. I don't know, if, could you hear the small break in? Okay, so then I'll play one that's very small and you, you can just tell me whether you can hear this one. Five milliseconds. Did anybody hear that? No, okay. That's, that's true. So in the laboratory, we invite you into a booth. We put earphones on you. It's completely silent. You can practice for a while. And if you were to do that, you would be able to hear the last one that I showed you. And if we actually look at how well infants can perform in this task versus adults, then this shows data from Lynn Werner's lab. These are three-month-old infants, six-month-old infants, 12-month-old infants, and adults. And you can see that infants up to one year perform, can detect a 50 millisecond gap. That was louder than the first, uh, longer than the first one I played for you. So they're able to detect only a very long gap, whereas humans are able to detect at best about the last one that I presented for you. So this trajectory, if you follow it out across development, um, and here along the x-axis is years for humans, then g this gap detection phenomenon reaches adult levels of performance about at four years of age. So that's pretty late. Human beings have already begun to um, not only acquire language, but speak complete sentences. Yet the, the skill isn't intact yet. So here's another basic skill, the ability to localize sound in the environment. So here we'll look at data that asks, what is the minimum angle that one can detect? And the way it's performed is to first listen to a sound that comes from straight ahead, and then ask the question, can you tell the difference between that sound and one that comes from just one degree to one side? Or can you tell the difference between a sound that comes straight ahead and one that comes five degrees off to the side? Or 20 degrees off to the side? Or 45 degrees off to the side? Or all the way to one side of your head? And if we perform those sorts of tasks on um, children from, um, from months of age all the way up to adulthood, we get this kind of graph. So once again, age is plotted on the x-axis. Um, the first ages right here are in months, so it's up to about one year. This point right here comes from five-year-old children, and the last point comes from adults. And what you can see is that at at five years of age, um, children can detect, oops, I, uh, yeah, children can detect about a two degree difference. So one, just for reference, if you put your thumb up in front of your eyes and hold it up, that's one degree, visually. So, um, so, it, so five-year-old children can, can distinguish a sound that's just a little bit larger than that, whereas four-month-old children need about 20 degrees, about this much distance to tell it apart. So sound localization then, if you follow it out, occurs or reaches an adult level of performance a little bit later than gap detection. So now I'm going to um, jump to a piece of data from the nervous system to pose the question, do we know anything about central nervous system coding that would allow us to interpret why um, a young infant can't discriminate a sound uh, across location as well as an adult. Um, and the cue that we're going to look at is called interaural level, or the sound intensity difference between the two ears. And all of us can generate interaural level differences because our head acts as a wall or creates a shadow. So if a sound comes from one side, its intensity at the near or ipsilateral ear is louder than the sound at the contralateral ear. So let's just look to see how neurons encode that difference. Um, and and w what I'll do is first just sort of introduce the central nervous system. So um, the cochlea is the place where sound is first transduced, and Professor Petit talked a good deal about that. The cochlea projects to 
the first um, processing stages in the nervous system called the cochlear nuclei. And the cochlear nuclei project to a good many places. But amongst the places they project to uh, is the auditory midbrain, also called the inferior colliculus. And I'm going to show you a set, one data set that comes from recordings obtained of neurons in the uh, inferior colliculus as sound is presented either to the contralateral ear or the ipsilateral ear. And we'll just ask how well can the neurons distinguish between the contralateral and ipsilateral sound level? Can they adjust their discharge rate? Can they encode this sound level difference? So here's the, here's the way the data will be presented. Along the x-axis is interaural level. So if, if the numbers are positive, then sound is on the ipsilateral side, that is the same side as the neuron is recorded from. If the numbers are negative, then sound is on the contralateral side, the opposite side that the neurons are recorded from. And we'll ask the neurons if they can tell the difference by simply recording how many action potentials they fire per second, or their firing rate. And just for, for reference, the biologically relevant range of level differences, that is, those that are present in the free field as animals move about the environment, varies um, between about negative 12 to plus 12 um, decibels. And that depends on the absolute sound, sound frequency and other details. But that's, uh, these data come from gerbils, which I work on, and the biologically relevant range was obtained from those same animals. So here's how adult neurons encode intraoral level difference. They, um, in, the, in the inferior colliculus. They discharge at their maximum when sounds are located in the contralateral side, and they gradually decrease their discharge rate as sound moves to the ipsilateral side. So I'm showing you three example neurons. And you can see that much of their discharge rate varies in this biologically relevant range. So now I'm going to show you three neurons obtained from juvenile animals. They can hear just fine. They're just younger. And these are shown in blue right here. So two things are very obvious. The first one is that the absolute discharge rates are much less. So in, in nervous system terms, there's less information. And the other strange thing here is much of their discharge rate varies outside of the biologically relevant range. And we can quantify this by plotting midpoints. So we'll just, we'll just plot the midpoints for all the adult neurons we recorded from, and the midpoints of all the juvenile neurons we recorded from. And I'll just show you all of them together, all the adult ones and all the juvenile ones. And when we do that, we see that um, the adult neurons um, at least for the median midpoint, is centered right in the middle of the biologically relevant range. But for juveniles that are very young, a great many neurons and the median are really to one extreme of the biologically relevant range. So we don't have yet a perfect correlation between um, sound location recording and the perception of sound location, but we have a, what we call a candidate. And this was the point that I was trying to stress in the beginning. We really don't have good enough behavioral and neural data for me to tell you this is the mechanism that supports the development of auditory perception. At the very best, we tend to have these sorts of data um, from the same animal at a couple of different ages. OK, so here's, I'm going to show you just a couple more, just to give you a sense for how long it takes for things to develop. So um, this, in this task, Humans come into the laboratory, they hear nine sounds. They hear three sounds that are of the same duration. They hear another three that are shorter in duration. And then they hear um, three sounds that are of the original duration. And the question is simple. Can you tell the difference between the duration of these three and the ones that came before and after? So let me play this for you. So this is when the duration is um, 100 milliseconds different. 
So that's 100 milliseconds different. Fifty milliseconds different for the one, one, three in the middle, and twenty. Did anybody hear that? So once again, conditions would be optimal in a laboratory, and you'd get there. But I, this one popped up early. These are four-year-old children, so they do much worse than the than the task that was very easy for all of us to hear. Even at five and six years old. Kids, are, they're speaking, they're, there's nothing special has to be done to test them. They understand the task, they can perform the task, they simply don't do as well as adults. And by the time um, we reach college age, when these data were taken, then we can detect a difference that's about 20 milliseconds. So when we look at this one, this uh, duration discrimination matures a little bit later, somewhere around six, seven years, depending on how the test is performed. And um, the final one I'm going to talk about has tremendous implications for our ability to communicate with one another. Um, and it involves the modulation of sound level. So this is a, a, a sonogram, and it represents frequency along the x-axis, and the, the heat map, or the color scale, represents the intensity of each frequency. So red is high intensity, blue is low intensity. Um, this is the, the English sentence that was spoken as this sonogram was obtained. The box contained a thin letter from Italy. This is the sound level only of, of this sentence up here. You can see the sound gets loud, soft, and loud. And this is the envelope only, or the maximum, um, the maximum level obtained as the speaker um, states, uh, asserts this, this uh, statement. And this is called the envelope or amplitude modulation. We can't study amplitude modulation in non, or um, speech comprehension in non-humans, but we can study amplitude modulation. And amplitude modulation is a very important substrate for our ability to communicate with one another. Um, and uh, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to play for you now a few different amplitude modulations. Let's see if this works. So this is 100% modulation. Uh, 40% modulation. 20% modulation. And 10%. Did anybody hear the modulation of the last one? You can, you can almost get it. Um, so in, in the laboratory, um, when, when people uh, come in, humans uh, come in at different ages, um, at between about 8 and 12 years of age, they're able to get only about 30% uh, depth on average. Um, and by 17 to 27 days, on average, they get about 20%. And that's a significant difference. And this, therefore, emerges relatively late in development. So, Amplitude modulation detection emerges somewhere around 12 years postnatal. And of all the different ones I've been talking about, this is the one task that we have reasonably good behavioral data from developing non-humans. And that gives us the opportunity to explore how the nervous system encodes it. Can we find an explanation for amplitude modulation uh, detection maturation? And then, at the end of the talk, I'll ask, can we, can we ask whether a period of sound deprivation or hearing loss early in development disrupts the maturation of, of this process? And we work on um, gerbils. I mentioned the species before. So gerbils begin to hear at about postnatal day 10, like most rodents do. However, they have a pretty long um, developmental trajectory. They don't reach sexual maturation until postnatal day 90, three months. And one of the reasons that we use this animal instead of mice is because um, from hearing onset, which occurs at about the same time till sexual maturation in mice, is a much shorter period of time. So if one is interested in the development of perception and the development of neural properties that support perception, then you simply have less time to do that in a mouse than you do in a gerbil. So we have a longer period of time to perform the tasks we want to perform in addition, um, gerbils hear low-frequency sounds, the, the frequencies that I'm using to communicate to you right now. 
whereas mice don't have very good, have poor low frequency hearing. They don't hear very well below about four kilohertz. So if one is interested in sounds that um, are relevant to our ability to communicate, gerbils are, are somewhat of a better model. Uh, on the other hand, mice are the model for, for looking at the genetic basis of all kinds of developmental factors. So I'm going to show you a movie of a gerbil listening to and detecting an amplitude modulation. So you'll hear an ongoing noise, shh, and then there'll come a time when it begins to modulate. The gerbil has been trained, this is a, a, a young gerbil, has been trained to drink from a water spout, and it's been trained to release the water spout, to pull back from it when it hears the amplitude modulation. And then we can simply change the depth of modulation and ask what is the minimum depth that the animal can detect. So they can be trained very quickly within a few days and we can test them and get their thresholds very quickly at different points in development. So let's see if this works. I don't know if you heard it, but the if you didn't, the animal did, um, the animal's a good performer, the animal detected the amplitude modulation and, um, and, uh, and released the water spout there we go. Um, when, when it came on. So we performed, um, we performed the same sort of task for data I just showed you in humans. Remember, humans' threshold drops sometime after 12 years of age. When we perform this task in gerbils, it's the same format here except um, ages in days instead of years, then animals performed relatively poorly at 25 to 40 days. This is after they've been weaned, they're living on their own, um, but while they're still in the juvenile period. At 40 to 55 days, they're still not at adult thresholds, and when we tested them at postnatal day 90 approximately, then their thresholds were at about 30 percent depth. So there, there are a, a number of, of um, details about this. Animals can get better if you train them for a longer time, but these are what we think of as their native thresholds, their abilities without, without a lot of training, just with our ability to test them. So now we have a, a behavior, we have a phenotype. We have a behavior that develops over the course of a pretty long period of time, and we can go into the nervous system and ask whether there really is some kind of processing correlate that might help to explain this. So now, um, I told you about the projections from the cochlear nucleus and lower brainstem up to the midbrain. The midbrain projects to the auditory thalamus, the auditory thalamus projects to auditory cortex, and I'm going to show you some recordings from auditory cortex, single neurons, in, an awake, in awake animals as we presented amplitude modulation sounds um, and we just simply asked the neuron, what's the smallest depth that you can detect in terms of discharge rate? So here's how, I'm, I'm going to show you first how I'm going to present the data to you. So each of these, uh, you can see the amplitude modulation waveform in the background. This axis is time. Um, there, are, there are four modulations in this particular example. And each of these little marks is a single action potential. So, um, and there are, there are 10 trials. So we challenge the neuron to 10 trials of amplitude modulation. Um, and we counted up all the action potentials. And to present the data, I'm going to show you the data in this form. We, we wrapped or we folded the stimulus based on period. So we created a single histogram of discharge rate across um, all periods, but all laid on top of one another. So we can see that this, this particular neuron increased its discharge rate um, as the amplitude of the stimulus became large and decreased its discharge rate as it went smaller. And I'm going to show you now a series of um, amplitude modulation responses just like this for uh, a summary data of all the adult neurons and all the juvenile neurons that we recorded. So this is now an amplitude modula, a single amplitude modulation period um, for the stimulus. And this is a stimulus at 5 hertz. And really, the neurons displayed no change in discharge rate at 5 hertz. That is, 
there was no information to tell the, the animal that the stimulus was modulating. At 10% modulation, we first began to see an increase in discharge rate as the amplitude increased. It was very obvious at 20% modulation and still more obvious at 40% modulation. So I'm going to show you the same data for a set of juvenile animals recorded somewhere between the two uh, behavioral epochs that I showed you, between 29 and, and um, 40 days postnatal. And here, let me just add these. Here, um, just, just like in adults, there was no information at 5%. However, at 10% AM, um, the juvenile neurons were quite different than the adults. They displayed no detectability. They couldn't detect the 10% signal. At 20%, they first displayed a response that was somewhere above baseline, whereas the adults were much larger, and, and so forth. So if we, if we quantify this, if we plot um, a quantity called power, which are um, spikes per second squared divided by the frequency of the modulation, then we see that as a function of amplitude modulation depth, power increases much more rapidly for adult neurons than it does for juvenile neurons. So we believe, at least for a first pass, that we have a, um, a functional candidate that would potentially explain the animal's inability to detect amplitude modulation stimuli in the juvenile state um, and, uh, and perhaps uh, a maturational event that could explain adult detection. So why am I hesitant? because these data were taken in separate animals. All of the behavior was obtained in a group of animals that were performing the task and trained. And all the physiology, everything I'm showing you here, were obtained in untrained animals that were awake um, and whose head was fixed in place and for which sound was presented to one ear. That is a very controlled situation, but not a natural situation. So we're in the process now of doing the heart experiment. We're implanting animals with electrodes um, in auditory cortex, training them to perform the task as young juvenile animals with the electrodes there, and recording the responses of auditory cortex neurons during task performance as the animals perform the task. So we can find out whether we get a perfect correlation. That's what we're after. Can we really explain the performance of this kind of task with neural sensitivity in real time as animals perform the task. So that's sort of the, the holy grail for any kind of developmental study, any kind um, of developmental study in any sensory modality, vision, audition, gustation, somatosensation, and so forth. And really, as a broad field, we, know, we do know very little about um, this, this particular aspect right now. So finally, and, and perhaps most complex, I want to show you something that seems to mature the latest. This isn't really a perception. It's more like the ability to improve on a perception. And it's called perceptual learning. This is the work from Bev Wright's laboratory. She's at Northwestern. So it's a very simple task. Children come into the laboratory, and they hear two intervals. They hear beep, beep, and then they hear beep, beep. And the duration between the two sounds is longer on the second trial. And the question is simple. Can you tell the difference between the first trial and the second trial? And children come in on day one, and we find out how well they do. And adults come in on day one, and we find out how well they do. And then they come back day after day for 10 days, and they take the test over and over and over. And we ask, or Bev asks, how, well, uh, do, how, how do human beings improve on this task? So this is kind of amazing um, in the sense that um, we do improve tremendously compared to our abilities walking around the world in our entire life our entire life. So I'm going to show you data from paper that Julia Hike and Bev Wright published. I'll show you a pretest interval. I'll show you the threshold in terms of the, the difference in duration that individuals could detect. Um, and I'll show you data from adults and 14-year-olds. They, they both came in, and they both had the same baseline detection ability. And then the adults came back day after day for 10 days, and they got better. In fact, they got twice as good as they were before. So their original threshold was 20 milliseconds, and they went down to 10 milliseconds. So here's 14-year-olds. So it's really kind of amazing. So they 
drive <laughs> um, and certainly carry, carry on very sophisticated conversations. But in, in this domain, um, they don't learn. And the, the truth of the matter is that um, I'm hiding one aspect of the data. Half of the 14-year-olds did learn, and half of them got worse. And I'm, sh I'm showing you the mean data. So there's a very interesting detail underneath this plot. Nonetheless, it's an extraordinarily late developing phenomenon. And, and honestly, it has, it's a cognitive phenomenon. It has more to do with learning than hearing, per se. So, that, so perceptual learning happens somewhere around 14 or after, depending on the individual. And Sarah Woolley and I published an article a little while ago where we went, we went down a whole and, and summarized a whole bunch of different auditory phenomena, auditory perceptual events. Um, and we asked, at least for a laboratory test, when did they reach adult sensitivity? So starting with frequency res resolution and entering the perceptual learning. And we found that um, many of them extended into adolescence and they weren't synchronous. Some things mature early, some things mature later. So it's an extraordinarily complex kind of, um, kind of uh, phenomenon that, that we're going to have to study. I'm just going to, I'm going to skip this one today. It's interesting, but and move on a little bit to um, now the development of central nervous system. So I, d I admitted that um, we have only a modest ability to explain how perception matures from having looked at um, the coding properties or the firing rates of individual neurons in the central nervous system. But let's dig a little bit deeper into the nervous system and ask um, what kinds of properties might, might explain these at a, at a more reduced level connections, synapses, function, these sorts of things. So the point here is that much, much cochlear, um, in fact, probably all cochlear, and much CNS maturation precedes, occurs before um, perception reaches an adult-like state. And I'm going to summarize, I'm going to, this is adapted from, uh, uh, from a review article uh, from Bulankin and Moser a few years ago. I'm going to summarize um, all of cochlear development for a typical rodent, for a mouse, just to uh, give you a sense for how things develop inside of the ear. Um, spiral ganglion cells, these are the neurons that carry information from the ear to the central nervous system, are born um, before embryonic day 15, so in utero. Um, oops. Um, the first axons from spiral ganglion cell neurons project out, uh, begin projecting out towards their target, both the ear and the brain, um, before embryonic day 13. Um, the, these axons reach the areas of inner and outer hair cells um, around, between around um, embryonic day 15 uh, and just before birth. Synapses, contacts between these first neurons, um, begin to form right at birth. Outer hair cell afferents um, actually have formed and begin to be eliminated or refined um, somewhere after birth, somewhere around postnatal day five. Hearing onset for a mouse is at postnatal day 10. And by hearing onset, I mean the ear canals open and sound can activate the cochlea relatively easily. So all of these things happen before the animal hears airborne sound. Um, mature inner hair cell innervation occurs just a few days after that, and mature outer hair cell innervation uh, occurs by about postnatal day 20. So we, we believe, we don't have a lot of great behavioral data on mouse development. There is some from Gunther Eret. Um, but we believe that all of these things really occur before the animal uh, reaches a mature level of processing from the point of view of auditory perception. So now I want to compare with another um, beautiful image created uh, uh, by Lou et al. This is um, from Lisa Goodrich's laboratory. I want to compare the innervation of these neurons, these first neurons that are born in, uh, in, the, uh, in the periphery, spiral ganglion cells. I want to compare their innervation of the cochlea, they send one process to the cochlea, with their innervation of the central nervous system. Really, is there any difference? Is brain innervation different than ear innervation? The answer is no. Um, and here's the, here's the data. So between embryonic day 12 and 13, as I, as I showed in the last slide, um, spiral and ganglion cell axons um, grow out and begin to make contact with the cochlear nucleus. This is the first central nervous system structure. 
At the very same time, their peripheral processes, called dendrites, grow out and innervate hair cells. So they're doing the same thing in the ear and the brain at the exact same time. Between embryonic day 16 and postnatal day 0, um, they, they spread out in the target, they find about the right place, and they begin to form synapses. And they do this in the central nervous system during the exact same period of time that they do it in the cochlea. This shows processes spreading out and innervating either the row of inner hair cells that uh, Dr. Petit referred to or outer hair cells. And then between postnatal day 6 and postnatal day 15, um, synapses mature and they begin to function pretty close to an adult level of, uh, <coughs> of functional properties. Pardon me. <clears throat> pretty close to adult level of function if one, if one goes on. And once again, <coughs> the synaptic maturation occurs, occurs over pretty much the same chronology in the periphery and in the central nervous system. And I, I, <coughs> I could go through this kind of central nervous system <coughs> innervation description, synapse formation, functional formation for the midbrain, for the cortex, <coughs> and pretty much it would be about the same period of time. That is, across these ages, um, <coughs> neurons are born, they grow out, pardon me, they innervate their target, and they form functional synapses during this, <coughs> during this age range. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> I, I have. I have one, thanks. I'm, I'll suffer through it. <laughs> um, so, one so even though um, it's before uh, perception reaches maturation, these neurons in the periphery, meaning the spiral ganglion cells, begin to fire spontaneously. <clears throat> they become active. And this spontaneous activity is very important for the normal maturation of the central nervous system. So even though perception isn't maturing, the activity of the brain, the spontaneous activity of the brain, brain begins to have um, a strong effect on, uh, on the maturation of the tissue. <clears throat> so this was discovered by uh, Nick Trich in Dwight Bergel's laboratory. Um, they removed the cochlea from animals at postnatal day 7. This is mice or rats before the animals can hear. And when they took out this tissue, they were able to record from auditory nerve fibers while manipulating the, the hair cells or recording from hair cells and manipulating uh, the supporting cells around them. And what they discovered was that supporting cells <coughs> at this age release little bursts of ATP. <coughs> and these little bursts of ATP depolarize inner hair cells, they fire, they release transmitter, and they cause auditory nerve cells to fire. So this is not sound generated at all. This is a developmental process that occurs within the ear, presumably us too, before animals hear airborne sound. And this is some of Nick's recordings. These are inner hair cell recordings in blue. So every time ATP is released, the inner hair cell depolarizes. <coughs> and every time the inner hair cell depolarizes, it releases transmitter, and the auditory nerve fires a bunch of action potentials. So, is this important? Is this activity important? And I'm going to show you two pieces of evidence to say it's extremely important to how the nervous system is wired, and presumably has very strong effects ultimately on perceptual skills, even though it occurs long before the animal is using its nervous system to do anything. So I'm going to show you data first from um, a group of neurons in the ventral part of the brainstem called MNTB. And MNTB neurons innervate a couple of different postsynaptic cells. I'm going to show you two data sets, one from MSO cells uh, and then later one from LSO cells. So here's the, here's the blow up of this part of the brain. MNTB cells are themselves innervated by the cochlea. They project over and, send, and make little um, projections onto specifically the cell bodies of MSO neurons. And just for um, the sake of completeness, MSO cells are the first neurons in the brain to integrate input from both ears, and they encode um, sound location as a function of interaural time differences. 
So they integrate inputs from both ears, but I'm speaking about them only, for, uh, only in terms of developmental innervation purposes today. <coughs> so here's, here's data from Benedict Grotha's laboratory showing the, the specificity of this innervation. So this image shows MSO, all of the red shows MSO dendrites, and all of the, the blue or blue-green here shows the receptor molecules that are op opposite this, uh, this axon projection, and these are glycine receptors. This is an inhibitory projection. So it's extremely precise, almost solely on the cell bodies in adult animals. So uh, Benedict Grotha's laboratory did a manipulation. They removed the cochlea contralateral to the MNTB and therefore denervated it. That is, they got rid of the spontaneous activity that I just told you about. And the question was whether this spontaneous activity was necessary for that system to generate its very precise innervation pattern. <laughs> okay, so get rid of the cochlear nucleus, these afferents uh, sort of degenerate or they're silent, and you ask what the innervation pattern is in MSO. So this, this is an MSO neuron right here, a schematic, the cell body region would be right here. All of this is dendritic region. These are, these, um, uh, this image comes from an adult normal animal. Each little dot here, once again, is a glycine receptor patch where a synapse would be. And you can see that in the denervated animal, there are a lot more glycine receptor patches out in the dendrite. Just cut away the cell bodies to make it a little bit easier to see. So a failure to eliminate synapses occurs when this early spontaneous activity is eliminated. And uh, Benedict, they, they went ahead and quantified that, but I think a picture, picture speaks a thousand words. MNTB neurons also innervate another group of cells nearby, LSO neurons, and they do so topographically. That is, low-frequency MNTB cells innervate low-frequency LSO cells, high-frequency MNTB cells innervate high-frequency LSO cells. And here's a schematic that illustrates that. So this would be high-frequency MNTB cells, make a nice precise projection over here in LSO, low frequency, make a nice projection over here in LSO. Carl Candler's group performed um, a, a little bit more uh, elegant experiment to test whether spontaneous activity is involved. In this case, they, changed, they kept the activity in, in, intact, but they changed the pattern of activity, that is, when action potentials fired across time. So this shows uh, control activity, from a normal cochlea in a, in a control, uh, I think, postnatal day nine mouse. <clears throat> so the activity is spread out in time, but it occurs in bursts. If one eliminates the alpha-9 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunit from these animals, they live just fine. It's a specific receptor that's, uh, that's in the cochlea, but the pattern of activity changes dramatically. So now all the action potentials occur in, in short, little, intense bursts. So just as many action potentials, but the pattern is different. A, a little bit more elegant way of asking, does it matter? And when Carl, Carl, uh, Amanda Klaus and, and Carl's laboratory did this, they found that in control animals, the MNTB cells formed very broad arborizations at postnatal day 12. And during the course of development, these arborizations came very, became very specific. This is what I tol told you before, very specific innervation patterns. But if they looked in alpha-9 knockout animals, they found that these broad arborizations at postnatal age 12 did not become refined. So different system, but almost an identical result to the one from Benedict Grotha's laboratory. A failure to refine or, or optimize synaptic connections occurs when spontaneous activity from the cochlea is somehow disrupted, either eliminated or changed in pattern. So this is an early sign of something that occurs long before perception is mature, but is probably, we don't know yet, nobody has taken behavior from these animals, we've, we've pro it probably has um, a very important role in generating a nervous system that can perform proper computations. Okay, um, so, this, so the point of what I just told you is all this activity-dependent synapse elimination occurs before adult perception emerges, and that raises the question, um, are there later periods of synapse addition 
or elimination or changes in function that do correlate with these long drawn out changes in perception that I was telling you about. And there, there is data, it, not too much from the auditory system, but I'm going to show you a bit of data now that does suggest, at least for humans, um, that, uh, that, these, that these events are very drawn out. They occur over the course of a decade or more. So this data um, comes, it actually comes from prefrontal cortex. There's no reason to believe that this general data is different for different parts of the cortex. Um, and this comes from Pashka Rakish's laboratory. They, um, they did Golgi staining of neurons and they counted the little spines, the postsynaptic enlargements where uh, excitatory synapses are made. And they did it from, um, from uh, post-mortem tissue in humans of different ages. So this shows one month, two and a half years, 16 years, 28 years, 49 years. Uh, so they were counting these spines as a proxy for or as a way of estimating the number of synapses made during the course of development. So here's the, um, so and they did it in two different places. So here's the amazing result. Along the x-axis is age and years for humans. Along the y-axis is plotted the number of spines per 50 microns of dendrite. And you can see for both places in, in these neurons, the number of synapses, according to this measure, continues to increase up until about five, six, maybe seven years of age, and then undergoes really a profound period of, um, of decrease that goes well past 20 years. And then ultimately there's, there's a period of aging uh, right here where there's an additional loss due to senescence. So there really is a period of time during which synapse addition and synapse elimination probably is occurring in the auditory cortex. And they're, they're, it's a candidate. It may well relate to the ability or the delayed ability of humans to perform optimally. There is one old data set from Huttenlocker, which I'll play here. So this brain will spin around. It's the same type of data uh, that he obtained from very um, laborious electron microscope counts, electron microscopic counts of synapses. It's, it wasn't performed in the way that modern stereology is performed, but it largely has um, the, same, uh, the same form as the data I just showed you. So I'll just play this little movie. So this is a visual cortex. You can see that his count showed visual cortex synapses going up uh, by at a year and declining over the next 10 years. Um, auditory cortex synapses also increasing maybe up to five years and then going through a profound period of decline and prefrontal cortex which is the data that I just showed you. So this data which occurred before that that I showed you previously is pretty much gives the same general impression. Things mature in the cortex over a very long period of time. A more, actually I'll skip this. Let me, um, a more recent um, functional study from Elise Sussman's laboratory looked at just basic sound evoked cortical responses. So these are obtained from scalp electrodes um, and we really don't know the, the neural mechanisms that account for the shape of these waveforms, but we can see if they're the same in young kids and adults. So this shows a sound evoked response in an eight year old subject and a sound, a sound evoked response in an adult, very different in form. And Elise did nine year olds, 11 year olds, and 16 year olds. And you can see that they, wore, they continued to be different. It moved towards an adult phenotype, but it occurred over a fairly long period of time. So at least it's quantifiable data from humans that suggests that development does progress over a, a long period of time. And then um, finally, this data, which comes unfortunately from visual cortex, not auditory cortex, but again, I have no reason to believe it would be different, comes from a Pinto et al. paper in 2010 looking at the expression of two different GABA-A receptor isoforms, alpha-1 and alpha-2, as a function of age. And again, age in years along the x-axis and, um, uh, and uh, receptor expression uh, pr uh, expressed as a normalized quantity uh, relative to the youngest age group. So the youngest age group is normalized to one. And you can see that the alpha-1 receptors rise over about 10 years of time. 
and alpha 2s decline over about five, maybe six years of time. So here now is a pretty detailed analysis right down to a single protein or two different proteins showing that their expression pattern changes dramatically during the times that I was talking about at the beginning of the lecture, the times when, um, when perceptual abilities, presumably computational abilities, cha change dramatically. Okay, so do, do the maturation of these synaptic properties trap, track perception? Well, I, I made the argument that, that the ones that I just showed you for visual cortex would likely track some aspect of human auditory perception. Um, but we also looked at this particular measure in inhibitory synapse physiology. And I want to remind you that um, we at least have one perceptual measure to, uh, to compare it to. And that's this amplitude modulation detection, which continues to improve um, after postnatal day 55, somewhere between 55 and postnatal day 90 reaches uh, adult maturation. Uh, let me skip that. So the way, we, the way we did this is to record from single auditory cortex neurons in a brain slice preparation. And as we recorded um, from them, we could uh, measure inhibitory postsynaptic currents. And, I'll, and what this graph will show is age in postnatal day uh, post days. Remember, this is the juvenile period. Animals are adult or sexually mature at postnatal day 90. Um, and what I'm going to show you is one measure, which is um, how, uh, how rapidly inhibitory currents return to baseline. And this is a pretty good proxy for or functional measure that correlates with the isoforms that are expressed at different ages. So these are now, you're looking at how quickly these little inhibitory postsynaptic currents returned um, to baseline. You can see it's very slow here, it's faster here, it's super fast here. And I plot for you data that was obtained by Antikesian across a really broad range of ages. And we do know that somewhere between here and here is when amplitude modulation detection reached adult levels of performance. So we, at least in, in a non-human model where we can do more invasive measurements, we do have a measure at a more detailed level, at a synaptic level, that says we can find things that do mature very late in development and are, once again, candidates that might help to explain um, uh, prolonged development of, of perception. All of these things would, of course, have to be tested by um, manipulating them. Okay, and finally, the last part is, now that I've told you a bunch about development, um, that I want to make the point that since things are in the process of changing, we as, a, as, a, as developmental biologists believe that that is when they're most vulnerable to environmental manipulations. And for the purposes of this lecture, the environmental manipulation that's, uh, that's most germane is hearing loss, developmental hearing loss. Uh, there, are, there are many, many types. Um, most are genetic, as Professor Petit talked about. Um, however, there are a significant number that are, um, that are, congenital, that are congenital, but not due to, um, to genetic causes. Uh, some of them are early noise exposure, which is probably um, an environmental risk that's growing uh, in level. Some occur due to middle ear infections, which young children um, have uh, at least, I think, something like 15 to 20 percent of children have relatively severe recurring middle ear infections, and these are associated with uh, a level of hearing loss that's about like putting your finger in, in your ear canal, about that level of hearing loss. So these things uh, do <coughs> occur during the period of time when perception is emerging and when kids are learning language or using language to learn other things in school. So they're a significant risk. So I'm going to show you two experiments that, um, in which we've deprived animals of sound, either permanently or temporarily. In each case, we're not damaging the cochlea. So, uh, we're, so the cochlea should be operating as it would in a, in a control animal. We're just preventing the animal from hearing sound. 
Um, hearing onset in, in gerbils is postnatal day 10, and one manipulation is to perform a permanent, uh, a per, 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 a permanent reduction in hearing abilities by removing one middle ear bone called the malleus. We do it bilaterally. And if we do that, then um, the conducting hearing loss persists, and we can test animals, their perceptual abilities, or we can test animals, their, uh, their ability to encode sound stimuli. We can obtain brain slices and test synapses all the way out here in adult animals. The second paradigm, which might be more uh, comparable to otitis media, middle ear infections, where the period of hearing loss is only transient, um, we can mimic this by placing uh, earplugs in animals' ear canals uh, from the time of hearing onset and then remove them um, sometime later. We usually leave them in for about 12 days or so and then remove them and raise these animals again to sexual maturation and ask, is there any consequence, is there any long-term impact of a brief, a transient period of hearing loss <coughs> where we can verify that hearing is normal? after we remove them. So here's, I'm going to show you three pieces of data, and then I'll be done. Um, the three pieces of data are very much like that that I've already shown you for normal development. I'll show you data on perception. I'll show you data on the encoding of sound by auditory cortex neurons. And I'll show you data on inhibitory synapses, all, for, all, from, animal, all from control animals and animals that had hearing loss. So the first data is perception. If we remove um, the malleus, that is, we produce this conductive period of hearing loss and test animals as adults on their ability to detect amplitude modulations, then their thresholds, the smallest modulation they can detect, is on average larger, poorer, for the animals that grew up with hearing loss than control animals. There's a broad range. Some animals do just as well as adults, as, as control adults. Some animals are far worse, but as a group, it prevents, it produces some sort of risk for poor performance. Interestingly, if we do the same kind of uh, test, but we do it during development, that is, we put earplugs in for a short time, take them out, wait a bit, and test the animals while they're still young, we see the same effect. So this is Melissa Karras's work. This is now uh, animals that had experienced a 12-day period of hearing loss, but are now being tested when their hearing is perfect. And even these animals display a, a level of, of deficit that is significantly worse than controls. Once again, a really large variance. The controls have a large variance, too. But as a group, they they're on average worse. OK, so <coughs> let's put that away and ask, how, how are cortical neurons processing these sounds in animals that experienced a period of hearing loss. I'll show you the same kind of data that I showed you before for development, these period histograms. In fact, these are identical. The control um, cortical neurons responding to 5% depth, 10% depth, 40% depth. And now the same thing from animals that grew up with conductive hearing loss. And once again, I think you can see that the ability of the cortical neurons to respond is diminished compared to the controls. So they're at the level of cortex, after this manipulation has had an impact on all, perhaps all synapses all the way up to the cortex, those neurons are poorer encoders of amplitude modulation than in controls. Put that away. And finally, look at synapse function. So once again, talking about inhibitory postsynaptic currents. And here, just looking at how big they are. Um, this shows the size of inhibitory postsynaptic currents, 30 picoamps, in control animals, brain slices. This shows how large they are in animals that grew up with hearing loss, about a 30% reduction in the strength of inhibition. And same thing, if animals experienced only a transient period of hearing loss and we let them grow up to adulthood, so now months of normal hearing, they still have a 30% reduction in the strength of inhibition in auditory cortex. So for a transient period of hearing loss that is totally reversed, the central nervous system remembers that. And it, it retains this deficit permanently throughout life. And from, from our, our theory is that this 
always, pre it always presents an impediment or a problem every time um, animals, or perhaps humans, are presented with a new task to learn or a new task to get better at. So in principle, it would have implications for all the perceptual skills that I <coughs> talked about at the beginning of the talk. So here's the summary. Um, perception matures slowly. I think I said it a hundred times, so just, just, um, just uh, emphasizing it. Most CNS synaptic properties mature before adult perceptual performance is attained. So there are many um, really profound chain, developmental changes in the nervous system. They're all necessary for adult performance, presumably, but they all occur, almost all of them occur, long before adult performance is reached. Therefore, we still sort of need that magic. What is that thing that allows animals to operate as adults do? Um, and the CNS, and, and that is the CNS mechanisms that correlate with perceptual maturation are still largely unknown. And, and the reason they're largely unknown is that I think the only way to find them is to choose the right parameter, the right cell type, the right um, thing to record, the right analysis, and to record that in real time as animals perform perceptual tasks. That's the only way to, to find out whether they're perfectly correlated and then ultimately change them, alter them, disrupt them real time as animals are performing tasks to find out whether those are really necessary for the animal to perform the task as it did. And those things are probably now possible with the sorts of optogenetic manipulations that are available um, largely in mice but also in, in many other animals. And that's it. Thank you very much.